this is the pre-recorded presentation for chapter four that uh, uh, would uh, uh, be presented live as a live sync session on Monday, November the 2nd at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I pre-recorded it and it's going to be in the recorded presentations page. And you can also see it on the uh, uh, announcements link. So what I'm going to look at today is this chapter four physical layer using the presentation I'm showing you on the screen slightly in gray. It's the one that says alternate one ITN chapter four G dot PowerPoint. And that's the PowerPoint slideshow I'm going to show you guys now. So this is uh, still chapter four. They hadn't rearranged this chapter yet, network access. And we're gonna look at, uh, um, we're looking at the physical layer today. The, we'd looked at the OSI seven layer reference model, which has been sort of de-emphasized in the CSNA curriculum now. Um, but the physical and data link layers were part of what we call, we still uh, like to use the, the TCP IP or Department of Defense model, of what's called the network access layer. Some new textbooks may break this network access layer into the upper data link layer and the lower physical layer, but we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at mostly physical layer stuff today. A little bit of media access control up in the data link layer. So when we see these two models, uh, the the, the the OSI seven layer model has seven components to it, and then the TCP IP model, which was the original model that was actually used by the internet. Uh, this I, I call this a de facto model. We're actually using this still today. And anytime you put together something that really works, like Ethernet or the Internet, uh, the engineers all get around the table and decide we want to write a standard for this, and we want to make it as complicated as possible. So that's why in the OSI model, they use all seven layers. In the real world model, we make do with four layers just fine. So TCP, TCP IP itself doesn't say what protocols are you going to use when you transmit over physical media? That's up to the engineers that design Ethernet or a token ring or point to point protocol or whatever we're using to connect the different places together. Uh, TCPI itself just says we're going to go from this internet layer. This is our layer that, has, that routers live at, with IP addresses like IP4 and IPv6 addresses. And um, uh, the OSI layers one and two, the physical and data link layer, they're going to have to specify. You know, what do we actually do to send a series of bits? So if you look at the physical layer as a whole, it's really three things that are we're looking at. Big picture here, three things on the physical layer. One is we're going to somehow represent our bits, our ones and zeros, with electrical currents or with flashes of light through a fiber optic cable or radio frequency transmission waves through the air like in Wi-Fi. And the second thing we're going to do is we're going to send these bits at a certain rate of speed. For example, the original Ethernet was 10 million bits per second. Uh, we currently use mostly gigabit Ethernet, so it's uh, a billion bits per second. And the third thing that the physical layer is concerned with is since we're transmitting, say, electricity representing an Ethernet signal, we have to have a physical complete loop of electrical wiring with electricity to flow through. So that means we all have to agree to use RJ45 cable connectors that are on all the Ethernet cables so that we can get the electricity from one point to the other point, so that we can represent our bits as ones and zeros using some type of electricity. So let's look at the uh, data link layer for just a second. I mentioned this earlier in an earlier presentation in that we have IP addresses, like IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, at the network layer or the internet layer. And then at the data link layer, we have an addressing scheme there are physical burn-in addresses that are present on the network interface cards, the so-called MAC addresses. MAC stands for Media Access Control. That's one of the two big concepts at the data link layer. So as uh, information is passed in this point, let me see if I can do it. So here's our little bit of information we're trying to get down to the user that's trying to look at this web page. Uh, that data itself will never be changed. As a matter of fact, the entire IP network, which comprises this whole thing here, will never be altered in any fashion as it goes through its journey through. It looks like it's going through five different hops here before it gets to the final uh, destination network you're supposed to be at. However, as the packet passes from this network to this network to this network to this network, there's going to be changing the physical uh, data link addresses, the MAC addresses, as it goes through each one. 
So it's like I gave the example before, if you put an envelope in the mail, no one scratches out and puts new codes on your envelope. But the envelope is physically encapsulated in a mailman's leather bag, and then uh, it goes into the post office sorting system, and then it goes in a plane or a truck to the destination post office, and then it goes in the mailman that you will receive the letter from, his leather bag, and then eventually it's encapsulated in your mailbox, and you can pick it up and see it. So those letters, uh, those addresses, those, those numerical values change constantly as it goes from one point to another point. Like your envelope doesn't get changed any, but envelope's like an IP packet. It doesn't get changed any as it goes from one part of the network to another part of the network. And then we have the concept of encapsulation and de-encapsulation where that original chunk of web data had to be encapsulated in the you know, hypertext transfer protocol at the application layer. And then that was all encapsulated in a TCP segment with a sequence number at the transport layer. And then that was encapsulated in a network packet, the equivalent of our mail envelope, at the network layer, layer three. And then eventually would be encapsulated in an Ethernet frame, which is everything here. At layer two, that will be transferred into bits. Bits are layer one physical layer devices. The bits would stream out of the device through the red arrow. And then when they were re-encountered by the next device, he would re-encapsulate everything. And this process is repeated over and over until our workstation here that's viewing this web page finally gets the data he really needs, the HTML code for what is that web page. He can display it on the screen. Now let's look at connecting to the network. This is a typical looking home router type device. Most home routers have a four port ethernet switch, blue, it's almost always blue, and they have a yellow plug that goes to the internet or it might say WAN instead of, uh, it might say LAN and WAN instead of ethernet and internet. And then they have a, a Wi-Fi system built into them. So we could use a wired connection, for example, we could subscribe to a cable company and use their ISP, or maybe we could subscribe to uh, the telephone company and use their service. Uh, there are some providers that are offering uh, wireless connections using radio waves. Um, so at some means, we're going to have some device. Uh, you buy it yourself. Sometimes they provide it for you. For example, in Fort Worth, a local cable company can provide you a combination cable modem and Wi-Fi and Internet access box. I'm on the telephone company system. They provide us a one-piece box that does everything. It's the uh, uh, super fast. Uh, uh, DSL type connection, about 75 megabit that I get, and then it has the four ports, Ethernet ports, and it has uh, their Ethernet, their internet port that ties into their proprietary system. So you subscribe to, let's say, a cable system. That's easier because cable systems just work right out of the box. You can buy any home router and not configure it. It'll just start working. You don't need passwords like you do with the phone company. So you connect your laptop computer or home computer or even a desktop computer. You're connected with the yellow Ethernet cable to one of those ports on that router. And then you'll connect the other plug will connect to your cable modem. Now, if you get the one box from the cable company, this is all included in one box. You don't have a separate device, separate cable modem, and a separate home router. So home, I'll call these integrated service routers. Now, a network uh, connection is present on most devices today by default. So on your home laptop computer, there's usually a plug on the side. On your home computer, there's usually a plug in the back plane where all the plugs for the printers and the audio connections and the video ports go. And on our routers that we use, well, we've got Ethernet ports on them too because routers typically connect a couple of Ethernet networks together. The second floor of our classroom building is the uh, business department, and then the first floor is our computer science department. They would be connected together with Ethernet ports. And then we would have uh, uh, WLAN or Wi-Fi connections available if we had Wi-Fi clients. So if I have a Wi-Fi type LAN and we're in a very large building, one device isn't enough. Maybe you live in a large ranch style home and one is not enough. You can get uh, range extender devices that would extend these and give additional Wi-Fi access points in your house. Uh, wired devices are just a single, since Ethernet wired devices is a 328 foot limit, you normally don't have to do any time of extension to those. No matter how big your house is, I can put your Ethernet device somewhere in the middle of it and it'll reach 328 feet to every point in the house. 
But with Wi-Fi, we sometimes have to use range extenders. So when we look at the physical layer, this is the bit layer here. All he's concerned about with is what's the rate of speed? Uh, what represents a one, what represents a zero, what type of electricity or what kind of signal represents our ones and zeros? And then how do we physically plug these devices together so we can transmit the electricity back and forth to represent our bits? So they don't care about what the upper layer information is any more than a telephone cares about what, lang what language you speak in. A telephone will simply convert your electrical, your, your sound waves from your speaking into electricity and send it to the other telephone. It doesn't care about what language it is. The only language is the, the only thing it has to agree about the languages is the two speakers on the phone need to both understand whatever language, English or Yiddish or whatever they were speaking. So this is the representation here of the physical bits, the ones and the zeros that are sent through the wire signaling our, our bit levels, ones and zeros. Everything has to be transmitted into ones and zeros, but computers do that anyway. They transmit, everything is converted to ones and zeros so the CPU chip can work on it. Everything is converted to ones and zeros so it can be stored on the storage devices like the hard disk drives. So a physical layer, it could be, um, it could be electrical signals through a wire like this. It'd be a complicated electrical signal. So we're trying to pack more bits in the same amount of space. It could be lights of various colors from, from uh, lasers going through a fiber optic cable. Or it could be radio frequency signals being transmitted through the air, like in the form of Wi-Fi. So these are all considered physical layer stuff. Anything that we can use to send bits, we can send, for example, Ethernet over. Well, I could send Ethernet over barbed wire, anything that would give me the connection. So at the upper layer, we have the Internet Engineering Task Force, the volunteers that built the Internet, and they make up our, they have made up all our TCP IP standards, all our protocols like IP and FTP and so forth that makes the Internet work. At the physical layer, there are some different organizations that set what the physical layer standards are, for example, for Ethernet or for telephone conversations or things of that nature. So the Internet Engineering Task Force handles, handles our upper layers, and the actual physical software and hardware that's designed that we use, software engineers uh, uh, do that designation. So here are some standards organizations such as the ISO. Well, uh, this is the organization that, for example, it, it, when, you, when you buy a bolt for your car to repair your car, the bolt pattern, the threads per inch is a certain standard. We have metric standards for, connect, for threaded connectors, and we have, uh, uh, we have British standards for connectors. So uh, that's one standard for those. The EIA, TIA, Electronic Industry Association and Telecommunication Industry Association is a trade group that promotes the sale of the electronic equipment manufacturers and vendors. So it's to their advantage, for example, there be a standard RJ45 connector for us to connect all our Ethernet devices together in networking. Uh, ANSI is an American National Standards Institute. They have several standards, including the RJ45 pinout code, the ITUT is an international telecommunication group that makes sure that uh, international telephone systems can connect to each other and handle the billing codes so that the person calling gets the right bill. Uh, they're also handling many communication things today, like, uh, oh, the DSL codes that the old telephone company used to offer. To They're phasing those out now to, uh, to get internet service to home users. The IEEE is the uh, uh, a professional organization of uh, computer science engineering students and graduates and engineers that work in industry. So maybe their most famous standard would be uh, the standard for Ethernet 802.3 is a standard that they have written, uh, a de jure or a rules-based standard that they based upon the actual standard, the de facto standard that digital Intel and Xerox had already shipped into business and people were, all about, were already uh, uh, buying them. So at the when we look at our media, we talked last time about media and protocols and uh, end devices and intermediate devices. The media is the thing that the bits are transmitted over. So it could, could be copper cable. It could be like the Ethernet cables we use in the lab. So we have some components that we have that we, uh, uh, we put together these things like an, 
we're going to look at more of these things in more detail, like unshielded twisted pair cable, the connector types, ports, and so forth. When we have fiber optic cable, which is pulses of light, this is what we use to connect our campus buildings together with. Um, copper cable is good for up to about 300 feet. Uh, uh, and it has a distance limitation. F fiber optic cable is commonly used in a campus environment, like South Campus. It's also commonly used in office buildings where we have multiple floors and maybe the top floor and the bottom floor are more than 300 feet away. So fiber optic cable has some advantages. It can transmit higher rates of speed, hard to tap. Uh, so we'll talk about that as well. And then Wi-Fi, like a, a wireless media access, this is uses radio technology, uses radio waves to transmit our bits from one point to another point. So if we look at this, this question of, at the physical layer, I have to say something's a one or something's a zero. So how do we determine that? Well, the engineers came up with some methods of, of converting ones and zeros into some codes. And these particular signals will represent the ones and the zeros, depending on what type of technology you're using. Like for example, ethernet has a particular standard called non-return to zero, it represents or signals the ones and zeros on the wire. And then they're sent down the wire while all the receiving workstations can check them and use them if they find they have no errors. So uh, at layer one, we have all these, the, 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 the top one here, uh, non-return non -return to zero. This is a system that Ethernet uses, the original Ethernet. There are some other manufacturers that use other schemes for doing other things besides Ethernet. Now the concept of bandwidth. Uh, the how many bits per second is being sent down the wire? What's the wire's capability of handling how many bits? How many bits per second can it handle? It, it, full built, full boat uh, tilt here. How fast? However fast it can go. What's its fastest capability? So, original Ethernet was 10 megabit per second. We now have gigabit and faster speeds of internet. So, if you have if you're gigabit Ethernet connected to your home router, which you may be. And you come into the lab, your gigabit Ethernet connected to the to the county college college, college county uh, uh, network, the local area network, one billion bits per second. Throughput is a measure of it won't be quite as high as your bandwidth because as all these little as I take a, an application layer chunk of data and put it in a, a transport layer segment and then put that segment in a network layer packet and then put that network layer packet into a data link layer frame like an ethernet frame it adds some more overhead information and the process of having to chop the original data into small pieces and put it back together again so as a rough rule of thumb you lose oh uh, it takes about 20 percent or so overhead to do all this stuff so if your bandwidth is 100 megabit you're really going to be able to transmit about 80 megabits of data at a particular time, do the overhead of, of raw data, pure data, after all this overhead of network addresses and, and data link layer addresses and segmentation and so forth takes place. But he uses the example here, you go to speedtest.net and you'll it'll tell you how fast a connection you're getting. Whether you're Wi-Fi attached, your fiber optic attached, your regular ethernet attached to your network. So here's the back of a, of a Cisco router, kind of like the ones we have in our lab. Same model, the 1941 router. So we have some Ethernet ports that are present on this. Uh, ours come with two built-in Ethernet ports here and here. They're gigabit Ethernet speeds. Those are the ones we normally use in the lab, G00 and G01. They come with the baby blue um, console port which we plug our baby blue cable back at the rack, eventually works its way, warms its way back to the desktop. And every desktop student machine has got two serial ports that can drive two different consoles on two different devices at the same time. So the station you log into is typically hardwired to S1 and S2. And the workstations that between you and the next person with the X on it, that's typically wired to R1 and R2 if you use a router. So we go through and do these labs. Um, the newer Cisco routers have the alternative of using a miniature USB connector instead of a console port. Console port requires an active serial port on your computer, and most computers don't have those anymore. 
They've got USB, but they don't have the old South Zero port. So you can purchase a, a, a cable, appropriate type of cable, and install a device driver on your Windows machine, and you can come in as an alternative to having to use that maybe blue port, and you'll have a serial port on your laptop. Commonly, commonly these days, laptops don't have serial ports. They'll have USB ports. So you can get that cable and install a device driver on a Windows device. If it's a Macintosh, and of course, Macintosh it just starts working. And you could be able to uh, configure that device uh, uh, from that port instead. One or the other, you can't use both at the same time. There are USB connectors that if you want to plug in, say you want to upgrade, say you want to back up your starting configuration, or you want to install a new iOS. You can plug a USB card into that, just like you would plug into your Windows desktop computer and back up something from the hard disk drive to a, to a thumb drive. Okay, here's an example of some types of copper cabling. The one at the top there is, a, if you notice on the bottom here, there's a, some foil wrapped around this cable. This is a shielded cable. We don't have to use that much because usually just the twisting together of the wires and the regular cheaper copper cable is enough to, to uh, reduce the noise interference reject the noise to it won't be a problem for us. Maybe if we're next to a welding machine and an aircraft plant, we might have to use a shield cable. But no, normally we don't need to do this. So you notice there are four pairs of wire in each one of these. They're color coded. And these are used for the connect the four circuits that allow us to transmit bits. So since I have four wires, I actually could transmit four different bit streams at the same time. Gigabit Ethernet uses this technique to get more speed out of a old copper cable wire that was put in the wall 20 years ago. <clears throat> so here's a problem with electrical cable once you go over a certain length. And this is, um, this is due to the fact that when you send electricity, electrical current through a wire, as it travels through the longer and longer lengths of wire, it tend, the signal tends to degrade and sort of, uh, um, as we say in East Texas, it sort of peters out. And interference might be picked up. So our original digital signal, which exists here at the number one diagram, and our interference that existed on that wire, could actually change some of our ones to zeros and our zeros to ones. So the signal attenuation is the longer the wire is, the more, this is the due to resistance of the wire and the amount of current going through the wire from an electrical standpoint. And then the crosstalk is this feature that if there's electricity traveling through an adjacent wire, like a, your the guy's computer internet connection and the cube next to you, they can interfere with each other as well. Normally the twisting together that we do is enough, but this is not a problem. So standard unshielded twisted pair cable, like UTP cable, doesn't have the shield. Just the wires and they're twisted together tightly enough to where the uh, interference is, is reduced. The higher, more expensive cables twisted the tables Twist the wires together even more tightly, which uh, is the reason why category five, category six, category seven wires, as you go up in the number, the, the cable gets uh, is, is more immune to noise. If I'm in an environment where electrical interference is a big problem, I could add the shielding. That increases the cost of the wire. It increases the cost of the patch panels and the RJ45 connectors because they have to be shielded. It increases the expense of installing these wires in the first place. But usually when you install wires in, a, in an industrial or commercial environment, they're going to be there for 20 years. The wiring contractors, uh, structured wiring vendors, give 20-year, 25-year warranties on these. Now, we used to use coaxial cable, which is much thicker. And as a result, it didn't have this 315-foot, 100-meter limitation that onto the twisted paper cable does. This type, type of thick copper here could go for much longer lengths. But it was very difficult to work with, and so uh, everybody switched pretty much around 1990. They started switching away from copper-based cable systems to unshielded twisted pair cable systems because their friends at the phone company said, well, we're running everything on twisted pair cable. It's much easier to work with. So in a standard unshielded twisted pair cable, we've got an outer jacket. This protects the cable from being damaged. And we have our four individually twisted pair wire pairs. Each one of them is a separate electrical circuit, with his own current and his own resistance and his own voltage. And by being twisted together, this 
isolates them from the other pairs. Uh, they're color coded so that when the installers put them in into an installation, they'll punch them down. There's eight connectors on the RG45 connector, and each one of these colors has to go to the proper connector, other end, or you won't have a proper circuit. In the shielded environment, uh, we can have a shield over the entire thing, or as shown here, you can also individually shield each individual of the four wire pairs if you're really in a high noise environment. But that adds an expense and a, and a difficulty of installation. They're more difficult to install. Coaxial cable is a single inside wire with a shield around the outside of it, so it's very immune to electrical interference. It has a very large wire in it, so it can carry currents longer distances before we need to fix them up again. And these types are not commonly used anymore, but the diagram at the bottom shows the types of connectors that were used with these uh, different types of wiring schemes that were more common up to the mid-90s. Pretty much everybody stopped using these, and they went to the smaller RJ45 connectors, which is as difficult to plug in as plugging in a telephone connector. You just snap it in. Much easier to use. Uh, copper, he says, Cooper means copper. Copper media safety. This is electricity flowing through wires, and there could be hazardous voltages present on them. So every locality has its own particular you know, safety codes and fire department rules about what you can do with the wiring. You must connect the cables correctly to the proper port, make sure they're free from damage. And in our lab, you may notice that we have some big pieces of copper that ground all of our wiring racks with our router system, which is in them, so that they're, they're safe. They're not gonna shock you. So when we look at unshielded twisted pair cabling, there was the old Category 3 cable that I ran into when I started wiring stuff together in networks in the early 90s. Uh, there was a lot of Category 3 cable, which is only good for standard Ethernet, only good for about 100 megabit, up for 10 megabit. And then fast Ethernet came on the scene during the middle of the 90s. Category 3 really wasn't supposed to work for it. It, it worked okay for some of our guys because the wires were short enough. Uh, category 5 was the next standard, which is what our lab is currently wired with to the college internet system, to the college local area network. And that's fine for up to gigabit speeds. For our workstations, all our workstations in the labs are connected at gigabit speeds to the college's production network. But if you're doing new wiring today, you're gonna use category six or category seven cable to get the higher speeds and sort of future-proof yourself against whatever technology may come in the future. So here is, I call it a telephone plug on steroids. It's an RJ45 connector. A telephone plug is an RJ11 connector. Smaller, it only has four pins. This is the connector you see at the end of the Ethernet cables when you plug together a network and you create a local network. So cable types. Our lab today is on Ethernet crossover. I'd rather lab that we'll do on Wednesday. I've already posted a packet tracer and the recorded presentations of how to do this in packet tracer using the crossover cable in packet tracer. Normally, Ethernet straight through cables, this is the case where the uh, pin one of one connector goes to pin one of the other connector. There are two standards, A and B, and they have different color codes printed on them. It doesn't matter which one you use, but you'll, you'll use one or the other throughout your organization. Because if you put one wire in and use the A color code and the other end has the B color code, you'll end up with a crossover cable. Now, most devices these days are auto-sensing, so that shouldn't be a problem. But um, if you're trying to use a rollover Cisco cable, for example, to connect your device up, if they were switched, that wouldn't work. So Ethernet straight-through cables we commonly use today. The, uh, the Cisco code for this is yellow. The crossover cable is the one that we'll use in the lab. Uh, when you come and do the in-person lab, or you, you can specify crossover cable as dash lines in packet tracer. And the rollover cable is the baby blue proprietary Cisco cable that's used to connect the devices together. So there are devices made that can test these UTP cables, where you can make sure the cables are okay, and they're very inexpensive. You can have, they're not certifying devices, those are thousands of dollars, but they will test the wire to make sure that it's okay, and that pin one goes to pin two, pin one goes to pin one, and pin two goes to pin two, et cetera. Okay, so let's go to fiber optic cabling. Uh, fiber optic cabling, instead of using electrical current through cables, electrical current through a copper wire, uses uh, little tubes, little like think of them a little mirror tube, and you can show pulses of light in one end, and it's usually infrared where you can't see it. Uh, it looks kind of red. If, if you, you're not supposed to look at it in the eye, 
So the rule with fiber optic cables is do not look into a fiber optic cable with your one remaining good eye. No, shine it on a card piece of card stock or take a picture with your phone, but don't look at it in your eye. It can damage your eye. It's like looking at a laser pen. You're not supposed to look at it. So fiber optic cabling connectors look similar to the RJ45 connectors we use with copper, but they're not using electricity. Instead, what they're doing is they're sending little pulses of light through the little core of the cable. And then we add this, this material around it to protect the cable against being damaged. And when you look at the outside of it, it kind of looks like a copper wire. And these are good for much longer distances than twisted pair cables only good for about 328 feet, 100 meters. A uh, fiber optic cable can be good for much longer distances, maybe a, a mile or miles, depending on what kind of cable you get. So here are the two types of fiber optic cables. Um, single mode is the more expensive cable. And we used to use multi-mode cable in cheaper environments because it wouldn't go very far, but it would go between all the buildings on our campus just fine. But the current best practice today is only get single mode cable because the prices for single mode cable, which used to be more expensive, have now dropped down to where single mode, multi-mode cable, it's about the same price. So you preacher proof yourself and get single mode cable, particularly if you're doing a new installation, like you're moving into a new space with a company and they're building out their whole new network. So since it has a smaller core, it's, it can go longer distances. It compresses the light better and keeps it from bouncing around. It uses real lasers as the light source, which are more expensive than the semiconductor lasers. That are used, for example, a CD player has a little semiconductor laser. It costs about a nickel. Uh, real ruby red lasers cost a little more than that. They can go, maybe the phone company might use them to shoot uh, telephone long distance conversations 40 miles between here and Cleveland, for example, where they don't want to put a bunch of repeaters. Multi mode cable was previously the cheap method, and we would use it in a LAN environment, and the phone company would use single mode for their long distance telephone runs, and we would lease their space. So the core of multi-mode cable is much bigger around. It's a kind of a sloppier fit. And so light can sort of bounce around and become diffused, and it just can't go as far as it can in the, in the uh, smaller core of a, of a single-mode fiber optic cable. So it can go long distances. It can go a mile or two, but it can't go 100 miles like a single-mode cable could do. It uses very cheap LEDs, light-emitting dials as a light source. So commonly used in a campus network like a college campus commonly used within a building, like a, a multi-store office building, where it's, you want to use that instead of twisted pair copper cable because it's more than 300 feet from the top floor to the bottom floor. But falling out of favor these days, if you're doing a new environment, new installation, put in single mode. Don't consider multi-mode. There are some different styles of connectors that are used in the in twisted pair cable. Everything's RJ45. But with fiber optic cable, there are several different connector styles that could be in use, and they're illustrated here. The ones at the bottom are easier for users to use because they sort of snap in like a Ethernet RJ45 would snap in. The ones on the top, the ST and SC ones, well, which one goes to which one? There's one transmit and one receive. If you plug it in, it doesn't work. You just switch it around, and it'll start working. But the ones at the bottom, the LC connectors, are more foolproof because there's only one way to plug it in. It's going to be the right way. Fiber optic cables can also be tested with a device similar to uh, that little cheap box we use to check our, our twisted pair of copper cables. They're not quite as cheap because they have to do more expensive stuff. This one shown is a time domain reflectometer. It's pretty expensive, actually. It's over $1,000. But it can be used to test a fiber optic cable and tell you whether it's good or bad. And if it's bad, how many feet down the line is it bad? So this has been used by the telephone company for years. If they had a bad fiber optic line between here and Cleburne, they wouldn't have to go and physically examine 40 miles of wire on the side of the farmlands there. They could shoot the signal in from the one end, and it would tell them, well, it's exactly 20.1 miles down, and they could zoom in on that side much more quickly. So here are some comparisons between fiber and copper. So copper media generally goes pretty fast, but fiber optic is always going to beat it. So we're going to use copper cable for maybe one gigabit in our LAN and maybe in our data center where the computers are close together. Maybe we'll get 10 gigabit over these copper cables. If I want faster speeds than that, 100 gigabit is, is what I'm going to use. I'm going to use fiber optic cable for that. 
Copper meat is big distance problem is it's only good for 100 meters, 328 feet. So uh, if we want something longer than, well, it's more than 328 feet between our classroom building and the library, for example. So we have to use fiber optic cable to try to connect together all the buildings we have on our campus. To go between our campuses, well, it's 18 miles between here and downtown and between here and Northeast campus. So we would use fiber optic cable for that because it can go much longer distances. Copper media is relatively immune to electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference, but it's not completely immune. Copper fiber optic cable is completely immune because it, it doesn't use radio frequency. It doesn't use electricity. It uses pulses of light. So if there's a lightning strike or high electrical noise in an environment, it's completely immune to that. It doesn't pay any attention to this. For the same reason, there's no electrical hazard with fiber optic cable because it doesn't use electricity. Or there's you have an electrical cable between two buildings, there could be a hazard, a shock hazard, if a ground, if it was some sort of ground fault. However, copper is most commonly used within buildings because it's the lowest cost. We could run fiber optic cable to all of our client machines, but that would be a much higher cost. So typically, we use twisted pair of copper within the building. And then we use fiber optic cable between the buildings or between campuses or between uh, locations of our company. We have to have it for the distance and we're willing to pay the cost. It doesn't take that much skill to terminate an RJ45 connector on a piece of copper cable. It takes a much higher level of skill to properly build out fiber optic systems. And the safety precautions, well, they say the safety precautions are lower for twisted pair cable. The problem with fiber optic cable is the safety hazard is looking at the light. You don't want to look at the light because it could lead to, you know, hearing vision loss. So don't ever look directly at the light. Now let's look at the Wi-Fi. So with Wi-Fi, um, I mentioned earlier that the IEEE standard 802.3 for Ethernet, they came out with 802.11 standard for Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi was started very commonly being used about 20 years ago. They started putting every laptop, they put a Wi-Fi circuit in it. So this, uh, there are some several variations here that the original Wi-Fi was only good for about two, 11 megabit. And now we have some very fast Wi-Fi's that are just unbelievably high speeds. Uh, Bluetooth is the system that you would connect a mouse or a keyboard to your computer or maybe an earpiece to your telephone. It's supposed to be a personal area network, very limited speed. And then WiMAX is a standard that uh, if you're in an area where you can't get a cable company or a phone company uh, internet service, you might be able to subscribe to someone, a, a small business entrepreneur who's put up a tower like, oh, well, let's say the west end of Galveston Island. There's not many people there. Now, the phone company, it's not worth it for them to come in and put internet. It's not worth it for the cable company to come in. But a small business entrepreneur could put up a tower and lease a data line to the real internet and then sell what's essentially similar to Wi-Fi access to people that are staying in their vacation homes for a week and just sell it by the day. So Wi-Fi, the original standard was 802.11a. That was a sort of a medical standard. It was 54 megabit, not compatible with anything else. But the commercial consumer standard was 802.11b. That's the one that they put in, start putting all the laptops about uh, 1999 or so. 11 megabit standard, 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Um, it's forward compatible with all the later standards. So even if you have an old Hewlett Packard laptop from 1999 with Wi-Fi, it's going to connect to any modern device that supports Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi hotspot. Then as the years went through and on, the speeds got faster and faster, and um, this chart's slightly out of date. There are some standards that are very fast now, but they're all compatible with each other and backward compatible back to uh, the original B. So we looked at the slide before where we talked about the fact that no matter what our upper application layer data was, as it got encapsulated, it eventually is turned into bits. And those bits are shot out over the wire in the form of a copper cable electrical currents or flashes of light through a fiber optic cable or streams of a radio frequency energy over a Wi-Fi circuit. So again, the, the physical layer only cares about what's a one and what's a zero. I don't care what this upper layer data is. Not my concern, I'm just gonna send the data. So the data link layer 
which is the second layer, layer two of the original OSI 7 layer model. We look at our, our uh, TCP IP model, the dead link layer, physical layer are usually considered to be what we call the network access layer. The data link layer is what sends typically Ethernet frames encapsulating bits to be sent out over a copper cable. And they send these uh, information back and forth to other devices that are present on the network. So let's look a little bit about the data link layer here. So at the physical layer, we had physical copper cable or fiber optic media or Wi-Fi channels transmitting our bits from one point to the other. And then the data link layer, this is the layer where our Ethernet device lives, like the Ethernet NIC card that's in your laptop or the Ethernet port G00 port that's on our routers. So it could be Bluetooth, it could be Wi-Fi, it could be Ethernet, it could be any one of these different standards. So it's divided into two sublayers. The max sublayer is the kind of part that interfaces to the physical layer. This is the physical address of the NIC card, the MAC address. And so let me illustrate it this way. If you go to Fry's and you buy a, a desktop PC and you don't want to add an Ethernet connector to it, you go buy an Ethernet plug, probably cost about $10, and it would be PCI. Uh, most desktop computers use the PCI card sockets. So you'd open up the top of your desktop computer and you'd put in the PCI attached Ethernet card. If you have a desk, if you have a laptop computer, you'd buy a little Wi-Fi attached thing. It looks like a USB thumb drive. You plug it in one of the USB ports. And then also included in that box, besides the uh, printed circuit board that you plugged in, the PCI printed circuit board, was a CD with some drivers in it. Drivers for Windows, drivers for Linux, drivers for Mac OS X. And that's uh, uh, that exists at the uh, to the link control cell layer, that's the software driver that shims your physical hardware that you paid for it, into whatever proper operating system. So without the software to uh, uh, device driver to make Windows work, it won't start working properly. So you get both of those in the box. You get the printed circuit board, which is the Mac, and you get the LLC, which is the uh, device driver. To so we every time the guy in the purple shirt sends something, he makes a packet, and that little sort of uh, orange colored packet is put in the little light green Ethernet frame, LAN header, LAN trailer, Ethernet frame, and that goes to his, his uh, friendly neighborhood router, his uh, default gateway. So it'll go into here, and at that point, maybe he's at a remote office and he's using a serial connection back to the home office part right here. So this could be 20 miles or 200 miles between the two routers. Can't use Ethernet over that over a serial connection. So we have to take that Ethernet, they have to take that IP packet that was in here. And the one that's in here is the same one. We haven't changed it any. It was like that envelope that we didn't write any codes on. Same one. But now instead of it going in an Ethernet frame, it's going to go in some sort of serial connection frame, like maybe point-to-point -point protocol is very commonly used. And that would go back to the other router, and then he would receive the information. He would transmit it back into Ethernet and, and put it on the new network, back at the home office. So when we look at this layer two frame, we see our original upper layer data, that original packet of data, which may contain a web request or an email, something of that layer, some type of upper layer data. And we're going to make put it in a, in a layer two frame. And all layer two frame structures are very, very similar in that there's always going to be a header, some information that is, usually has addressing in it, and then a trailer, which is typically used to look for errors. So when we look at this header, there's, for example, Ethernet has a, a, a series of ones and zeros that says the Ethernet frame is fixed in the start. It's a wake up frame. It's called a preamble. And then there's some addressing. In Ethernet, we have 48-bit addresses, like the source address and destination address. And then Ethernet has a type length field that tells us, what kind of data is this? Is it an IP4 packet? Is it an IP version 6 packet? Is it a ping request? And so the top field identifies what that is, so it can be sent to the right lines of code to be detected, to be processed. 
Then at the end of each frame, there's typically a CRC, cyclic redundancy check, a frame check sequence. Since we're sending physical bits across the physical media like a copper cable, it could be possibly be interfered with and could be altered. We need to know. We need to be able to detect if the data has been altered in any fashion whatsoever. And if it has, to not trust it, declare it bogus, and throw it away. Eventually, the upper layer data will be retransmitted and we'll get, maybe get it properly this time. So Ethernet, for example, uses a scheme where he detects, a, he, he, he transmits when the sending workstation sends the Ethernet frame. He sends a 40, he sends a 32-bit uh, frame check sequence. A cyclic redundancy checks up, CRC32. And when the receiving workstation gets the frame, he recalculates the CRC and see if it matches what he heard on the wire. If they match, there must have been no errors, and he accepts the data as valid, and he processes it. Now, some layer, some layer two protocols will add frame stop signals. For example, on multi-port protocol, WAN circuits, we may have some start bits and stop bits. In standard Ethernet, uh, there is no stop, there's no frame stop bits in particular. He just lapses into complete silence when he's done. So how, when can we transmit on the wire? Whenever we feel like it, there's two ways we can do this. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna use the Three Stooges method. Remember the Three Stooges would poke each other's eyes out. They would do anything, whatever they want to do without asking. So Ethernet's kind of like the Three Stooges method. Any workstation can transmit a whole frame of Ethernet data whenever he feels like it. But he's supposed to listen first and wait if someone else is transmitting data. And if someone else is transmitting data, he waits until they're done and then he transmits his data. There are other data transmission schemes like IBM Token Ring, which is not very popular anymore, where you only one station could transmit at one time. You couldn't transmit unless you had a token. So there can't be any collisions with Token Ring because by definition they can't exist. Well, with Ethernet, we can have collisions. Two stations could listen to the wire at the same time and hear nothing and just coincidentally start transmitting exactly at the same exact microsecond when we get a collision. So that's okay. Ethan has a method for recovery from that. So in a multi-access network like an Ethernet in a building, everybody's multi-access. Everybody can hear each other. We have to wait and our turn to transmit. We have to listen to the wire first and then transmit. In a typical point-to-point -point link between two offices, the router point-to-point -point connection is only two devices, and they both can transmit and receive at the same time. So they will never have collisions. A point-to-point -point network, we don't have to worry about this. But in a room full of 24 students, we have to worry about what happens if two or more devices try to transmit exactly at the same time. So this depends on the physical equipment that we're using. So let's look at the left, that serial point-to-point -point connection. In the serial point-to-point -point connection, there's only two nodes. There's the home office and there's the remote office. No possibility of a collision because uh, uh, we can't interfere with anybody else. There's nobody else but us two. Two nodes. Oh dear, here's the dreaded, feared, and hated subnetting. We typically want to make a very small size network for a point-to-point -point device because we only need two network addresses. So, um, in the last, very last semester of the Network Academy, we look at HDLC and point-to-point -point protocol, how serial connections work. Uh, the trend these days is not use uh, serial ports, but to use Ethernet ports and have an Ethernet, uh, uh, Ethernet drop for the customer. So we're going to see serial ports go away. They're slowly being de-emphasized in the Cisco Network and Academy. Well, on the right-hand side, if we have a multi-access network, it's like we all have a tap into the network here, and we could possibly interfere with each other by transmitting at the same time. So standard Ethernet with hubs, uh, any type of Wi-Fi is a shared network, and they can collide with each other. So we have to have a method to detect and recover from collisions. We'll get more about that later. Now, physically, we have something that sort of corresponds to a blueprint for the building. And then logically, we'll have something that's more like what our lab reports look like. It's more interested in what's the, you know, what's the logical IP address and how are they connected together. So physical topology is uh, where the devices are arranged and what are the physical connections between them. 
So in the old days, we might use serial ports to connect our campuses together with. And the red lightning jagged bolt thing is represents serial connections. These days, we're much more likely to use uh, Ethernet over some type of WAN circuit over Ethernet, like Metropolitan Ethernet, Carrier Ethernet, one of these type of technologies that we actually use between our campuses. So we have very fast uh, Ethernet-based connections between our all the TCC campuses, they're 10 megabit connections, they're very fast. A logical network is how the network transfers the frames from one node to the next. And this is a, a, a function of the media access layer. So it could be point-to-point -point protocol, and it would have one protocol method of arranging the bits. It could be ethernet. These days, more likely everything's gonna be ethernet. The old token ring, IBM token ring, was a very technically, the system, but they sort of priced themselves out of the market. So, for example, in the early 90s, when I was doing work for a services provider, um, Ethernet cards at that time were about $100 for a good pre-com Ethernet card. Oh, they're down to $10 now. They're cheap. Uh, IBM token read cards were $800 a piece. So one of our clients was, well, Alcon Labs. Well, they're so expensive. They've got so much money. But they bought a laser printer for every secretary. They don't even make them share the laser printer. So, of course, they went with token ring because it's more expensive. So, in a point to point topology, addressing really is not that significant because there's only me and the other guy. I know that everything I transmit, he'll hear, like I'm the remote office. And he'll be the home office. Everything the home office transmits to me, I'll hear it. So, media access control protocol can be very simple. We don't have to listen if anyone else is transmitting first because there's just the two devices talking directly to each other. In a logical point-to-point -point network, there could be devices that are in the middle. Now, too, when we subscribe to a service from a service provider uh, like the phone company to get a connection, a data connection between two locations, of course, he's going to have his own intermediate equipment that does this, all the connections for us. But those are invisible to us. We don't have to worry about them. All we have to worry about is pretend it's an Ethernet port and dump Ethernet frames into it at our device at the South Campus, and it will magically appear like little Keebler elves made it happen at, the, at some Ethernet connection at the Trinity River Campus, and we'll get access to that data center. So it's kind of like a virtual circuit. Okay, Ethernet is a multi-access topology, so in the, all the classrooms, we have a bunch of computers, and they're all connected together, and they all can hear each other. They all have to have similar IP addresses so they can communicate with each other. Using the same shared media, well, it's sort of shared, but we don't use hubs anymore. We use switches. So switches give us some advantages in that. They reduce the collisions and get everybody faster bandwidth. But we can still see all of the other devices, frames, that are on the media if they send out a broadcast like an ARP request, we need to be able to all hear it. So we'll still be able to see it like it was an old hub, but in a much more efficient fashion. So in Ethernet, as a multi-access addressing scheme, we have MAC addresses that are 48 bits. Now, in this diagram, they're using a simplified four-digit addressing scheme. But every physical device in our location is going to have a unique 48-bit value. These devices in the graphic will have a unique four-digit value. So this address is used to specify the destination. Whenever Ethernet sends out data, he has eight bytes of a preamble. These are identical for every Ethernet frame. Then he sends the destination. Of, in this case, Workstation 2 is trying to talk to Workstation 6. And everybody else is going to be able to hear him. Everybody's going to ignore it except the one that's trying to get the message. So the first thing that's in an Ethernet frame that's unique is that unique 48-bit MAC address here represented by four sixes. And then he will sign it. Workstation 2 will sign the Ethernet frame with, with his debt. Sorry, so it knows who to answer. So the destination knows who's the answer. And we have that type length field that says, oh, it's an IP version 4, or it's a ping request. And then we have our upper, upper layer data. In Ethernet, that's allowed to be up to 1,500 characters of upper layer data. So this additional overhead adds about 16 to that. Ethernet frames are supposed to be no bigger than 1,516 bytes of data. A bytes, 8 bits of data. And then at the end is our 32-bit CRC frame check sequence. Well, let's see, there's eight bits in a byte, and there's four bytes here, so let me see. That's eight, four times eight is 32. 
there's 32 bits in a four byte sequence. So CRC32 uses all 32 bits to do that. So on a multi-access network, everybody is, uh, needs a unique address to live on the network, physical address. So in this situation, um, on the top, it's like what standard ethernet is. I'm gonna send whenever I feel like it. Uh, I'll listen to the wire first and be polite. And if I hear anything, I'll wait. If I don't hear anything, I'll go ahead and try to send. But I'll keep checking while I'm sending just in case anyone else tried to send exactly when I send. I'll call that a collision. And while we try to recover from this. Now in the bottom part of the frame of the graphic, controlled access, that's like IBM token ring. When you have packets of send, you can't send it whenever the wire, you can't just listen to the wire and say, I don't hear any bits, I can send it now. Instead, the wire transmits, a, a ring of wire transmits a token ring around the, the network. And if you have something to send, you're gonna, when the token comes around to you, you're gonna expand that token frame into a data frame and put your data into it and it'll be received. The receiving workstation will shrink it back to a token and then everybody else gets a turn again. So there's not possible to have collisions with that. It's much more efficient. So if you have hundreds of workstations showing a network, that's more efficient. So condition-based access is carrier sense multiple access collision detection, for regular old Ethernet. I'm gonna have a I have I'm one of those workstations on the wire and I have something I want to send and I don't hear any bits, I should be able to send whatever I want, since there's nothing else right now. So if someone else is sending, I'll hear their bits and I'll know that, well, I can't send my bits at the same time. That wouldn't work. We would both mess each other's uh, frames up. We'd both have to start all over again. So stations can transmit whenever they feel like it. They're supposed to listen to the wire first and not transmit when other people are transmitting. Collisions will exist because what happens if the guy on the left and the guy on the right both listen to the wire? It's quiet. They both just coincidentally transmit at the same exact moment. We would get a collision. So we have a mechanism for 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 taking care of that problem. Everybody stops transmitting, and they each start a random timer. And the workstation that randomly picks the lowest random timer will win the race this time, and he'll be able to transmit. Now in Wi-Fi, uh, there's an additional scheme because Wi-Fi is a little more complicated in that there's a lot more interference. Wi-Fi is an additional step called Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance where a Wi-Fi station that wants to transmit will do, it's kind of like a little ping. He sends out a little signal that says, I intend to transmit, everybody else shut up. And then he waits to make sure that it got received. And then he sends his data. Because Wi-Fi is shared, particularly the earlier, slower forms of Wi-Fi, it was like a shared ethernet hub. We wanted to try to reduce collisions. And that was also used by the original Apple Talk, uh, 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 EtherTalk type network that the Macintosh computers used. So typically we're gonna use carrier sense multiple access collision detection like a hub. These days we don't use hubs much anymore. We use switches because they are faster processing, they're more efficient. If it's Wi-Fi, we'll use carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance. And if it's a token ring network, which is not very common anymore, except at Alcon, we'll use token passing and that way we'll never get any collisions. And we'll get more details on this later. Now let's look at half and full duplex. Uh, a CB radio is half duplex. If I push down on the microphone, push the talk button and talk to you, I can't hear you until I let go. That's half duplex only. Only one person can send at a time. And while I'm sending, I can't receive. A regular telephone, I can talk to you, but I can hear you. You can interrupt me or you can ask me something while I'm talking and I can hear you and at the same time that I'm talking. Full duplex, I can send and receive at the same time. So in computers, some of the older systems were half duplex, particularly the old hubs. Only one station could transmit at a time. Two people couldn't transmit at the same time. But the newer systems like Ethernet switches, everyone's got like a, it's like a difference between a party line in the country with the old phones and to share the wire. And newer phones where you probably have, they'll have a party line with three other people in the block. You probably have your own private telephone line. You don't have to share it with anybody else. So let's look at this. Uh, picture here where a simplex, a simplex transmission is like a one-way street. You only go one way down the street. Half duplex is like there's a bridge out. Half the bridge is out. So there's only one link. Only one car can go one way at a time. Or the country bridge up in the northeast where they have the covered bridges and only one lane. 
had to wait your turn. So the old Ethernet hubs were half duplex, only one at a time. It's two way, but if you want to go the other way, you have to wait for the other guy to go his way first. Full duplex transmission is like a regular two way street. Traffic can go north and south at the same time. So most serial links are full duplex. Ethernet switches are full duplex. We get much more efficient use of our bandwidth. Okay, we looked at this earlier. An Ethernet frame contains a starter frame delimiter. In Ethernet, that's a bunch of the ones and zeros, 64 repeating ones and zeros. Then we have our source and destination address fields, like our my destination MAC address I'm sending to, and my source address that I'm putting on it so you know who to send the answer back to. The type field, which says what kind of upper layer data is encapsulated in that data portion, could be an IP version 6 packet, could be a ping request. Uh, some types of have quality control, Ethernet does not. And we have our upper layer data, a ping request, or that piece of email. And then we have our CRC, our air detection scheme, our frame check sequence, to make sure that the data didn't get corrupted when it was being transmitted down the wire. Some types of old serial things had things like quality control and congestion, notification stuff. Uh, that stuff's pretty much gone from the academy now, like frame relay. So the signals on the wire could be subject to interference or distortion or a loss because the wire was too long. And the bit values, like we saw in the earlier graphic, the bits, a one could change to a zero. Or a zero could change to a one, and that would corrupt the data we had. In that, uh, in that Ethernet frame we're trying to transmit. So the frame check sequence can detect this, no problem. When I transmit the data, I'm going to transmit a frame check sequence with the data. And when the data is received by the receiving workstation, he will recalculate that frame check sequence, and it should match what he heard from me. If it matches, the data is not, it's not correct. It's OK. It can be trusted. If it doesn't match even one bit, it's bogus. I throw away the whole frame and wait for him to retransmit it. Upper layer TCP will retransmit it. So cyclic redundancy check, CRC32 is a typical one that's used. The sending node calculates his own 32-bit CRC, appends it to the frame, transmits on the wire. The receiving node receives the whole thing, recalculates his own CRC, it should match what he heard on the wire. If they're equal, it's good data, he accepts the frame. If they're different, bogus, throw the frame away. So Ethernet is commonly used in local area networks. IEEE 802.2 and 802.3 standards for Ethernet uses 48-bit MAC addresses for source and destination. And we'll have more of this in a later chapter. Uh, for wide area networks, point-to-point -point protocol, it's remember this is only one router port at the branch office and one router port at the home office, a simple point-to-point -point network. Addressing is not important. We're probably going to expect the address 111111. There'll be a uh, flag at the beginning. It's only eight bits long instead of the 64 uh, bits that Ethernet uses that so will have our all ones address. And control and protocol bytes are used to tell what kind of upper layer data is encapsulated in this point to point protocol frame IP version 4, IP version 6, uh, uh, Novell Netware, uh, ping request. We can indicate this. Then we have our upper layer data, which could be any length. And then a frame check sequence is going to be the 16 or 32 bits. So a point-to-point -point protocol is typically used to deliver frames over least connections between different locations. It could be twisted pair cable, it could be fiber optic, it could be satellite radio frequency transmissions. Now Wi-Fi is more complicated because there's so much more opportunity to be interfered with by, oh, baby monitors, microwave ovens. So in the case of Wi-Fi, the frames are more complicated because they're allowing for this additional possibility you could be interfered with. So it's very similar to Ethernet, but it adds some extra stuff because we could have more interference. It's the same 48-bit addressing scheme, however. Uh, the uh, a difference is instead of uh, in Ethernet, it was carrying sense, multiple access collision detection. In Wi-Fi, they add collision avoidance, which sends this extra ping out for a workstation station sends its whole frame in an effort to reduce the collisions because uh, the older Wi-Fi systems were like Ethernet hubs. It was all one shared frequency. The newer Wi-Fi systems use multiple antennas like MIMO, 
you'll typically see three antennas sticking up from the back of the box. So that's kind of like a, a, a Wi-Fi switch instead of a Wi-Fi hub. It has more channels of communication, and it reduces the chance of, uh, of uh, collisions to occur. Okay, I've got to the end of that there. And uh, uh, then on uh, Wednesday, uh, you can either do your pi uh, packet tracer at home using the outline I already put on there, or you can come to the lab. And on Wednesday, I'll do the same walkthrough with real equipment in the lab, and I'll post that on the recorded presentations as well. So that finishes Chapter 4, and that's one for the books, and we'll stop.